or through tonight uh, or, or right now uh, is going to be in Philippians chapter 1. So we're going to study the Bible in Philippians chapter 1. And it was actually something that was suggested on Patreon. Um, so thank you so much for sending that suggestion in. Uh, so I'm starting in Philippians chapter 1, but I love Philippians chapter 2 as well. And and 3 and 4 actually are amazing in, in my opinion. And it's not like I know these, you know, off the top of my head. My dad has done it and um, he's had us and helped us to memorize chapter 2. But I, from my understanding and when I've read this um, more than once for sure, <laughs> when I've read this multiple times over my life and even just today, I've been fascinated by it. Uh, and, and the context to Philippians, the book of Philippians, is that Paul sets up this church in Philippi of, my understanding, retired Roman soldiers, essentially, like a retired community of Roman soldiers. And so he's writing to them some instructions, some guidance, some wisdom, and certainly the gospel truth to help them along the way in their journey um, following Jesus. So Philippians chapter 1, and we'll read this together. I just want to set this up for us. We'll read this together um, in the NIV. And, oh, there we go. I'm going to blow it up so that you can see it. Oop. Huh. Well, <laughs> give me a moment. I think that should. Nope, that did not do it right. Well, I guess we'll do it like this. Hopefully, you could still see it um, and we can read this together. Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to stop along the way um, and just talk about things and just discuss some of what we read. But I would like us to read together in the NIV just so we're all on the same page as far as the wording. But if you want to read something else, that's okay. Um, no harm, no foul. You read what makes sense to you. So in the NIV, this is what it says. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, when it comes to what God has started in every single one of us, I think we have to remember we're still works in progress. You're a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. Everyone is a work in progress. And the thing is, if we're all works in progress, then that means we're always changing. That if we're really works in progress, God is constantly trying to progress us, which means there's going to be change that is constantly trying to happen in your life, that God's trying to enact in your life. So the question is, are you always ready for change? Because I think what I mentioned with the church, um, if you were listening to the other segment, is what I mentioned with the state of the church is I think a lot of times we forget that change is part of what God's doing. That the only constant in this life is change outside of God because He doesn't change. And if we were just to embrace change, if we were just to constantly prepare our mentality for change, then we could start to really embrace this identity that we are all works in progress. Paul says, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So until we see Jesus face to face, each one of us is a work in progress. 
until we see Jesus face to face and we become like him, for we shall see him as he is, Paul writes in another letter. We become like him, for we shall see him as he is. Until that time, I think that was actually John, but until that time, we're going to be works in progress. You're going to see some ups and downs in your life. You're going to see some ups and downs in your own progress. We talk about this all the time in physical therapy, that sometimes progress is not so linear and straight. Sometimes it's, it's you know, um, a zigzag, but we want the trend to look up. We want the trend to go up. Even if it's up and down, we want the trend to eventually and overall go up. And that's what it is with every single one of us. We're, we're works in progress even at the moment that we, we accept Jesus and put our faith in Jesus as our Lord, as our Christ, as our Savior. Even to the moment that we, we breathe our last breath, we're works in progress. The importance is that we're, the important thing is that we're always changing. Of course, not just for change's sake, but towards the model and example of Christ Jesus. And it helps that we adopt a mind that is ready to change. Lastly there, at least before I move on to verse 7, the confidence that we have as far as progressing and, and changing to become more like Jesus is not that we could carry it on by ourselves, but that He who began a good work in you, in me, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So there's an ebb and flow. There's a tension of it is your responsibility to choose to embrace change. And at the same time, it's God who carries it on to completion. So the confidence that you have is not in your ability. It's your choice to want to change and to progress to become more like Jesus. But the confidence you have comes from the person who's changing you, which is God. Comes from the one who is actually carrying you on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, which is God, your creator, my creator. Here in verse 7, this is what it says. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have, I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. To piggyback, we all need God's grace, don't we? We all need God's grace. To piggyback off what I said, when, when everybody's a work in progress, and it's your choice to choose to want to change, and at the same time, it's God's ability to change you and bring you from uh, where you started to completion until the day of Christ, to piggyback off that, we all need God's grace. We all need God's help. And it's not just about being a, a changed person all of a sudden. Because here he talks about how love is something that we may abound more and more. Or at least our, add to your love knowledge and depth of insight. So even the way that you love somebody else. It might start one way. Even the way that you love somebody else is a work in progress. You might start loving people more than you used to when you start putting your faith in Jesus. You might love people more than you used to. But the way you love people at the beginning should also progress as you are constantly following Jesus and consistently walking with Jesus. As you progress in your relationship with Jesus, even your love should grow. Your love should get better and better. How? You don't just love generically or generally. You love progressively and in a way progressively towards the kind of love that Jesus has 
by adding to your love knowledge and insight. Because not everyone feels loved the same way. I hope you know that. I It's something that I had to experience a lot uh, through trial and error. Um, and, and so through labors and pains, let's say. Blood, sweat, and tears. I'll give you that other one. It's something that I had to learn that people and not everyone feels loved the same way. I mean, if you have a, a spouse or a significant other, you know that right away, right? The, the way that you think that you're showing love to them is not necessarily the way that they're receiving love from you. So knowledge and insight give us the best shot at making someone else feel loved, at making someone else feel valued, rather than just satisfying your own version of how you love somebody else. Do you really love them the way that they feel love, the way that makes them feel loved by you? And so even our love, as Paul says here, has to, has to evolve and progress and become more like the way that Jesus loved us. I'm going to read verse 12 here. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened Ooh, sorry, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. I'm going to continue. Yes, and I will continue. Oh, there, thank you, Paul. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart to be and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. I think the biggest thing we could take away from that is that hardships can advance the gospel, especially because the bad makes the good look that much gooder. It's not a word for sure, I think. But the bad that has happened to you that you've experienced, as bad as it was, as terrifying and terrible and horrifying, the bad makes God's goodness actually that much brighter. And the fact that you're standing on the other side of it, the fact that you're standing on the other side of that abuse that trauma, that pain, that hurt, that betrayal, that abandonment, the fact that you're standing on the other side of it, somewhat on your feet, is more, uh, more evidence that God's light is there, that God's grace is real, that God's goodness is real. It doesn't diminish what you've gone through. It doesn't make it any easier to think about it or to process what you've gone through. But God's grace is so real that you've been lifted out of that pit. Like Tim Tebow in front of Congress, 
who is hoping that he can lead the effort and help at least advance the effort of trying to rescue children that are being abused right now, sexually speaking, um, through online materials and other materials and just, you know, trafficking. You have been given an opportunity to share your story of hardship and how you've come out on the other side. That's what we're hoping for for those children. But at the same time, that's what you have in your life right now. That's what you have in your pocket, so to speak. A story, a testimony of God's goodness and grace that you have come to the other side because he's been with you all along. All the hardship that you and I face, ultimately, as Paul points out, even his chains, even his chains, his imprisonment falsely, false imprisonment, even that hardship will help advance the gospel of Christ Jesus. Because that bad, that evil, that terrible, horrific thing that happened, those horrific experiences, they can help advance the gospel of Christ Jesus. Because the goodness of God shines all the more. See, living in this world is difficult. In, in 2024, it's difficult. And I'm sure every generation has their own uh, difficulties that they can point to, that they've experienced or that they are experiencing right now. And thank God it doesn't change the fact that when you put your faith in Jesus, you will be with Christ for eternity forever. And this life is just momentary. But we still face the hardships that we face, all of us, while we're here. And that's why we have a choice. Because we're all going to face hardship. We're all going to face difficulty and trouble in this life. But we all also have an opportunity to make a choice. Like Paul says, live for Christ or live for self-gain. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So as to say that it's better for me to be with Christ in eternity forever and even that's essentially what death would become now for us is just a doorway for us to finally enter life, at least in eternity, with Christ. But think about all the people that you could help get to that same, same result, that same outcome by sharing your story, by sharing your difficulty, by sharing the goodness of God in your own life, the testimony of how God's grace has saved you in your own life so that they can also say to me to live as Christ and to die as gain because they can also come to that point at the end of their life whenever that comes and they're not going to be afraid of death because death is just a doorway to eternity with Christ. So I'm praying and I'm hoping that you're encouraged to at least share something about your story. Share something about your testimony. Share something about how God has taken you and rescued you from the pit in your life, from the darkness that you were in in your life, from the abuse in your life. I'm hoping that encourages you to open up because there are people waiting to, to be set free from whatever is holding them to the same things that you were held to, captive to. And they're just waiting on you. And maybe it's when you open your mouth, it's when you share the testimony of God's goodness and grace in your life, that's when they'll set, be set free to make a decision and actually see themselves maybe from a 3D or rather a bird's eye view. Because a lot of times when you're going through something, it's hard to see what you're going through um, from a composed third-party outside perspective it's really hard because everything you're feeling is what makes you see what you see you know the hurt and like i said the trauma and the abuse it's hard to see anything above that or outside of that it's really easy to see only that and to be blinded by it and to not see a way out not to to not see hope so sometimes when people share their stories I think a lot of times when people share their stories of where God took them from, 
it helps break those chains. It helps remove the scales from people's eyes so that they can finally see the situation they're in, but also the hope that God offers for every single person. I'm going to read the last few verses here. Whatever happens, in verse 27 here, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now I'll hear that I still have. I think if we, well, we are finishing there with Philippians chapter 1. If we just consider, again, the gospel message and how the gospel message of Christ Jesus and how it's affected us. If we just consider what we've actually received, that Jesus being the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, the Son of God, lived the life we could not live, died the death that we deserved on the cross, shamed, pronounced guilty even though he was innocent, that this Jesus also died on the cross and then rose from the dead on the third day. If we consider this gospel of Jesus that we received, can we really say that we're conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Can we really say that we are living in such a way that honors that story, honors that truth that we received? Can we say that the way we live our lives is something that Jesus would be proud of? I think that's what it comes down to ultimately. That as we strive together as one for the faith of the gospel, as he says, as we strive together, unite together in the one Holy Spirit that lives inside of us when we put our faith in Jesus, as we walk through this life together, can we remind each other and help each other and inspire each other to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ? Not to have this, uh, this hypocrisy. Of course, everybody will go through hypocrisy at, at points in their lives. But let's strive together to encourage each other and help each other and challenge each other to not let what our words say be different from the way that we live our lives. Is your life, the way you conduct yourself, something that lines up with what you say you believe? That Jesus loves the world, loves his enemies, prays for those who persecute him, for those who have persecuted him? Is that the way you live your life? That Jesus is one who turns the other cheek? That Jesus is one who gives without expecting anything in return? That Jesus is one who helps the helpless? Is that the way you live your life? Is that the way I'm living my life? We ought to be a community that is willing to strive together to challenge each other to ask these difficult questions and to call each other out when we need to. Because if we don't call each other out for not living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ, who will? The world won't call us out for not living like Jesus. They'll call us out because we're, we're hypocrites, because we say we're one thing, but we're really living another way. Or at least we say we're one thing, and we just don't even care about the way we live. And this is how we're going to be effective for Jesus. When our words and our what we say we value lines up with what our lives actually look like, what decisions we actually make, what words come out of our mouth, the thoughts and plans that we make, the like I said, the deeds that we act on. That is how we're going to be most effective when we have this alignment between our words and our decisions or our actions. 
not when we just say all the right things to sound Christian and and go to the right places to look Christian and, and, and dress all the right ways again to look Christian, but when we actually align everything with who we say Jesus is. Because that's the, the, the one standard, the one example, the one goal, the one Lord that we're following. It's Jesus. And it's only and always will be Jesus. Amen? So this is how I want to structure the amateur hour. I'm glad that you've joined me. I know it's super late. I know this is very uh, crazy. I don't know if this is even if you're even watching this at the same time that I'm, you know, running this live. But I hope that encourages you to seek the Lord, to follow Jesus, and to at least take a step back and say. Is my life lining up with what I say I believe about the gospel of Jesus? Because if it's not, then it's certainly worth, it's something worth changing. And if we're all works in progress, and God is the one who is able to change us, then we should always embrace change. I'll see you on the next Amateur Hour. Who knows when it'll be, but stay on the lookout.